Okay, so today we look at uh, this color. How to extend the zeta function to the entire complex ring? And uh, in order to do that we will take a detour, short detour, but still we have to take a detour and uh, introduce a familiar function to you, which is uh, the gamma function. You know gamma function what it is, right? It is this is the definition of gamma function. Of course, this is generalized to complex numbers. Okay. Uh, this is was originally defined for uh, real numbers as with the zeta function. And uh, what we know about this function is if z is a positive integer, then uh, gamma z equals z factorial. So, it generalizes the factorial function and that is easy to see, right. You just integrate this by parts. Now, so do you get z factorial or z minus 1 factorial? Let us see. Okay. You get z factorial? You integrate t to the z minus 1, okay, that is right. So, then that is you get t to the z by z, okay. Good. So, now if you look at, look at this function uh, and think of z now as a complex number. Uh, so, what can we say? So, firstly we have to talk about this guy being, first it is defined for positive integers very clearly according to this. But when z is not a positive integer, it does not have such a nice expression for itself. So, we have to uh, consider or analyze the, the behavior of this function on non integral values. So, first question that one asks is does it converge everywhere? So, what is your guess? Does it look like converging for all that? actually it does not and it is easy to see that. So, so let us just let us get back to this. So, this definition is of course, valid for oops, for any z that is how it is defined and let us integrate by parts. So, we get t to the z uh, then minus 0 to infinity, differentiate e to the minus t which makes this plus 
and you get uh, t to the now this is uh, as uh, for t equals 0 this is 0 for t equals infinity also this is 0. So, that first term is vanishes away and we get 1 over z gamma z plus 1. Okay, so, actually this tells us so that gamma z is z minus 1 factorial. Okay. So, this, but this relationship gamma z equals 1 over z times gamma z plus 1 holds for all z. Okay. Now, when z is 0, well gamma 1 is 1 that is straight away uh, by the fact that it is n minus 1 factorial. So, gamma 0 <coughs> is actually <coughs> infinite. So, it does not converge at z equals 0. So, that does imply that <coughs> excuse me analyzing this function is can be a little tricky. So, gamma 0 does not converge. So, let us carefully analyze this and let me write gamma z again. And the reason why we are suddenly spending time on gamma z will become apparent in a short while. Okay, so, z now takes any value in the complex plane. So, let us first draw this complex plane over here. So, what we know is that for every integral point it is well defined and has a nicely defined value. Now, for any z such that absolute value of z is greater than 1, not absolute value, again I am making a mistake here, real z is greater than 1. What can you say about the absolute value of gamma z? This is going to be bounded by t to the the absolute value of t to the z minus 1, which because the z is in the exponent and real z is the complex part of z will vanish away anyway in absolute term and the, so this will be some t to the alpha where alpha is greater than 1, oh sorry greater than 0, right. e to the minus t is of course, e to the minus t is always positive in the t in the absolute value this. Okay. And uh, this if you see will converge that is the value this is less than infinity. Why? Well, firstly alpha is positive. So, near 0 this is close to 0, right. As you go away from 0 the value increases, but then e to the as t increases e to the minus t really starts dominating t to the alpha and it very rapidly takes it to 0. So, this is a sort of an informal argument, but one can make it more formal by uh, just expand e to the minus t as a e to the minus t as power series. Mm. 
Not necessarily because this is going, that's still going to be Alpha become it. Hmm? Will come up with terms. Sorry? Alpha is bounded. Yeah. Some point yeah, actually, basically, you show that uh, beyond a certain t, this uh, more precise argument. Anyone of you have a more precise argument for this? Why should this converge? Only integers, yes, sure. Uh, the absolute value is uh, gamma alpha plus one. Gamma alpha plus one. Yes, that's true. But what about uh, what? Do, what can we say about gamma alpha plus one? Sure, I can say that this is the absolute value of gamma alpha plus one. But why is this bounded? Gamma alpha plus one is always al always converged, no matter how big it is, but it's not infinity. Why? Alpha is a uh, integer. No, alpha is not an integer. Yeah, alpha is a real. Mm. Green mean. Uh, uh, but can we say? Probably yes. I think gamma is defined for real values other than integers. Um, we can expand it. It is defined through this definition. And uh, but I think you can say that because if you see as alpha increases, the value of gamma will gamma alpha will increase. Because you the curve will always be above the curve for smaller alpha. Right, you are multiplying this by t to the alpha, which al as long as alpha is of course greater than 0, then it will always be above the curve. And so, the area under the curve will always be more than the area under the smaller alpha and therefore. That is only for t greater than 160. Only for? t greater than by area. Only for t greater than 1, fair enough. But between 0 and 1, this is anyway bounded. So, then you do not have to worry about it. Right, so that together will imply that this is okay so that no makes the life somewhat better that at least it's well defined on the entire real line not only sorry not on the entire real line but actually on the this half complex plane which is real z greater than 1 Okay. Now, what about the rest of the complex plane? So, this like again we are this is a situation like the zeta function, there is a uh, half plane on which it is uh, well defined and actually analytic, this is also analytic, it is an analytic function of z because again integrand is an analytic function of z and the second variable for every value of t it is an analytic function of z and the integral is fine will take you make give it and I will take. Okay. So, it is analytic on this real z greater than 1 and we again raise the question and we the reason why I am want to define it for the entire complex plane will become apparent very soon. So, let us define it to the left of the real z equals 1. Now, here unlike the zeta function, the life is or the pro process of defining this is much just use this equation. This is valid for all z. So, which means if you want for example, gamma half that is gamma 3 by 2 divided by half. So, you got the definition of gamma at this point. In fact, this is true for all points 
you can come. So, that is take this strip between 0 and 1 here, you can define the gamma value in this strip by looking at the next strip between 1 and 2 and the gamma values there and doing the appropriate translation. Once you have the gamma values here, you can define the gamma value on the, the previous strip between minus 1 and 0, just copying that and keep going back and this way you can extend it all the way. Okay. Not on all is for all set except when of course it diverges. So, when does it diverge? Does it diverge anywhere on the right side of this plane? Real z equals 1? It does not, it is well divided, it converges everywhere we have just seen. Okay. Does it diverge on any point between the 0 1 strip? No, because it just pulls out the value from the PS 1 and it's divide, it uses this relationship. And the only way it will diverge is when z is 0. So, the first value on which it diverges starting from the right infinity is at z equals 0, okay. except for z equals 0. What is gamma is minus 1? Gamma minus 1 is gamma 0 divided by minus 1 and gamma 0 diverges. So, minus 1 is also infinity, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4 essentially all negative integers including 0 is where it diverges and it does not diverge anywhere else. Okay. Therefore, gamma z is a meromorphic function on the entire complex plane with poles at oh by the way why does it why am I calling it pole at Okay, what is the nature of gamma 0? It is gamma 1 by z. So, around that therefore, has a simple pole, pole of order 1 at z equals 0. At z gamma minus 1, that is gamma 0 divided by minus 1. So, it is really again the same simple pole will get pulled in here and so and they will all work. So, no higher order poles occur anywhere. So, each of the negative integer point you get simple pole. Okay. So, good. So, now we understand the gamma function in the entire complex plane. Now, let us connect it with the zeta function and that is very simple, but it is it is the connection is very simple, but the idea that yes there is such a connection is non trivial. So, let us again consider the definition of gamma function no again and let's do a change in variable Uh, no, the other way around, sorry. T is n u. So, for T, everywhere replace n u. So, then what do you get? Gamma z is what happens to n greater than 0, of course. 
So, what happens to the limits? They stay 0 to infinity, comes n to the z minus 1 times u to the z minus 1 e to the minus n u and d t is n d u. So, n to the z of course, is comes out of integral. Now, this guy is familiar 1 over n to the z. This is one term in the zeta function summation. So, let us sum it over. So, this equation holds for every n, in particular for every positive integer, this equation holds. So, you sum over n greater than 1. No, I have not in greater than 1. Sorry. Sum over n greater than 0, 1 over n to the z, gamma z. So, this gives you gamma z this of gamma sorry gamma this is eta function times gamma z equals this sum. Now, what I am now going to do is interchange the integral with sum. Again, I have to be careful here, these are infinite sums and integrals, but because of the uniform convergence on the of the thing inside the integral inside, I can do this. So, I will go ahead and do this. And what is this? This is a familiar series. This is a geometric series with uh, multiplier being e to the minus u. What? There should be an e to the minus u on the top here, right. So, now we get this relationship between the zeta function and the gamma function. Zeta times gamma is this integral on the right hand side. Okay. We know that gamma is defined over the entire complex plane. So, if we can show that the integral on the right is also defined over the entire complex plane, then we are done. We got the definition of zeta function as well over the entire complex. So, let us look at the integral on the right hand side. Is it defined over the entire complex plane, which means does it converge first of all over the entire complex plane? It is unlikely, because we just saw for the gamma function integral that when real z is less than 1, then z minus 1 the real part is less than 0 and then the convergence does not quite hold actually, it does diverge. So, we cannot directly uh, use this relationship to conclude that uh, the integral on the right hand side does converge. 
unfortunately this is slightly different from the gamma function integral which allowed this beautiful relationship between gamma z and gamma z plus 1 which allowed us to extend it which no longer holds for this kind of integral. So, that is also a problem. So, just by looking at this relationship it is not clear how to extend it, but one can actually ex use su such a relationship to extend it. But for that one has to do a little more work. Now, there are two ways that little more work can be done and both these ways were given by Riemann in this paper. One way is to start with this integral itself and do something to this integral on the right hand side and then uh, transform it in a way that eventually it takes a form which we conclude it is uh, defined over the entire complex plane and then therefore conclude that the zeta function is defined over the entire complex plane. The second way is uh, more interesting which in that he starts with a slightly different relationship between the gamma function and zeta function. And that is one way I will show you because that gives something even more better than the definition of uh, zeta function over the entire complex plane. It also gives a relationship between different values of zeta function just like there is a relationship between different values of gamma function and that relationship will be very useful for us later on. So, let us adopt the second way. So, the second relationship So, again we start with gamma function and this time we do a change of variable again, but not in the way that ok. So, I should have done this right here. So, I will not consider gamma z, but gamma z by 2. Okay. Now, replace T by uh, I think it is pi n square u. So, this is a uh, funnier trans transformation and it is remarkable. I mean, it's, these are things that you just wonder how did it come by, by magic or something but it will you see that later on it will fit in perfectly with uh, our analysis. So, what happens then? Of course, limits remain the same uh, of course, here n is of course, 1, 2 these are n is always positive integer pi n square u to the power z by 2 minus 1 e to the minus pi n square u and d t becomes pi n square t u. Okay. So, this gives us 0 to infinity pi n square to the power z by 2 right pi n square z by 2 minus 1 and then 1 pi n square coming from here u to the power z by 2 minus 1 e to the minus pi now this was expanded out pi to the z by 2 n square to the z by 2 which is n to the z which is exactly the form we like.
and again do the sum, use the uniform convergence to push in the sum inside, we get zeta z Now, this sum which is inside analyze as the previous sum was that was, uh, but to it advance even faster than the previous one. In fact, that is the reason why we will we chose this because of the there are some points where it the previous integral was diverging, we choose a much faster converging sum here, so that that divergence can be eliminated. So, that is the philosophy. Of course, the question is exactly why this form, because this is something which we can still analyze, not as well as uh, the previous geometric series, but still it is amenable to analysis. Okay. So, let us look at this, let us give it a name W u. One thing that you can immediately observe here is that this is uh, symmetric uh, minus one by two, I think. See, for whether n is positive or negative, this takes the same value because there is an n square there. <coughs> and for n equals zero, this is one. So basically, all that is taken care of here. Okay, let's give small w u. Let's call this. Now, this sum is uh, a fairly nice sum. Um, those of you who have dabbled with some bit of Fourier analysis, no? Okay, does not matter. We will do a bit of Fourier analysis here. So, it is really a detour, and again, I will again warn you that. Uh, there are paths that I am to ask me why somebody could think of this. I do not know, but the fact is that it has been discovered and we, here we are. Of course, to, to demystify it a little bit, uh, I do not think anybody sat down in 5 minutes and in 5 minutes came up with all this analysis. It required a lot of hard work. I am sure a lot of different experimentation with different sums and finally, identifying what is the right one. Okay, so, now we want to analyze this and uh, in particular, what I want to do is w u with w 1 by u. Okay. And uh, we let let us define a function. Uh, have I used the symbol f? Probably not.
and consider the Fourier transform of this. So, let me prove the following lemma. Let's redo this. I should consider this as a function of n, not as a function of u. So, this is defined for different values of n. And uh, then the Fourier transform of this is f at m, or we can still write f at n, or let us write n. There is something here, I think it is square root of u or 1 by square root of u. So, do not take my word for this. When we derive this, we will figure this out. So, what is the Fourier transform of this function? Anybody remember definition of Fourier transform of the function? 